Artisans, scientists generally agree that a person's brain structure determines what kind of person they are. All of your psychological traits, including how quick you are to get angry, how much you like to read, and even how likely you are to do something nice for another person, physically exist in your brain. But historically, people have taken this idea beyond science into the strange territory of phrenology, where they tried to use the shape of your skull to determine what kind of person you are. Allow me to explain. Some scientists like to label specific places in the brain with specific functions. This is called brain localization. Evidence for brain localization partly comes from the fact that when a person gets brain damage, it can change pretty much anything about them, including their personality. The most famous case of this was a man named Phineas Gage, an average person who, after taking an iron rod to the brain, became an insufferable and irritable jerk, described by his doctor as intolerable to decent people. Interestingly, the thing that changes about a person who gets brain damage is to some extent based on which part of the brain got damaged. For example, damage to specific brain areas can cause anything from difficulties in face recognition to difficulties in navigation. And so, thanks to data gathered by neuropsychologists studying cases of brain damage, we know that who you are is based on the shape and structure of your brain. But scientists didn't always believe this. Today, let's take a look at one of the first historical steps into brain localization, called phrenology. If you've heard of it before, you probably imagine something like this. A map of supposed brain functions layered on top of a model of the human skull. It's pretty interesting to look at, but the map itself isn't actually based in science. So, where did something like this come from? There are four central characters to this telling of the tale of phrenology. In chronological order, they are Gall, Spursheim, Combe, and Morton. You can remember their order by remembering this handy acronym. Great Skull Curves, man! which is something you might say if you were a phrenologist. Franz Joseph Gall was an expert anatomist whose brain dissection techniques were so meticulous that even one of Gall's biggest critics, Pierre Florens, admitted that Gall was the author of the true anatomy of the brain. Ironically, it was Gall's careful brain dissection techniques that would later assist in dismantling the arguments of phrenology. Gall created what he called the Five Tenets of Cerebral Physiology in 1791, which were both genius and crazy. He later revised and expanded this list, but let's just stick to the basic five. Number one was, the brain is an organ of the mind. The fact that our conscious minds arise from what is essentially an organ made of fat powered by sugar is something that we take for granted today. But in Gall's time, not so much. In fact, Gall had the gall to suggest that because nerve fibers in the brain do not converge to a single point, there probably wasn't a seat of the soul in the brain. This was considered a scandalous idea by the church, which is why the emperor of Austria banned Gall's lectures in Vienna, and he was forced to leave the country entirely in 1805. And even though Gall considered himself a religious man, his writings were banned by the church and he was eventually denied a religious burial. Such was the controversy of his ideas. His second tenet was that the brain is not a homogeneous unity, but an aggregate of mental organs with specific functions. And the third was that the cerebral organs are topographically localized. What Gall meant by this was that different chunks of the brain were responsible for different things, such as personality traits, and that he could draw a map showing where those personality traits were located in the brain. This idea is still argued about today by some scientists. That is, there are still debates over how much of what the brain does can be localized to specific points and how much of it is distributed complexly. Many scientists today believe in brain localization theories, such as part X is responsible for function Y. But in the book, The New Phrenology, 
William Uddle argues convincingly that due to the deep interconnections between brain regions, many of the claims of localization have been overstated. At the very least, the boundaries between brain regions are gray areas. And not just because they're made out of gray brain matter. <laughs> Jokes for nerds. But it was the last two tenets of cerebral physiology that really drove phrenology. Number four, other things being equal, the relative size of any particular mental organ is indicative of the power or strength of that organ. Number five, since the skull ossifies over the brain during infant development, external craniological means could be used to diagnose the internal states of the mental characters. Basically, Gall argued that certain shapes of skulls inherently indicated increased intelligence when compared to other skull shapes. This turned out to be untrue, but that didn't stop the new field of phrenology and, later, skull-based racism from emerging from this idea. If you want to learn more about this scientific racism angle, be sure to check out Step Back History's Scientific Racism video. That sounds like a topic completely free of controversy, right? Yeah, Xander. While the ideas of phrenology can be played up as the example of the peculiarities of Victorian quote-unquote science, often ideas like phrenology were developed to give these unbelievably white people an excuse to support racist policies at home and justify literally conquering and subjugating people around the globe. If you want the much more sad and bitter story behind phrenology, after this lick of salt, go see my video. Just be sure to have a lime wedge to bite into after. Maybe a cat video or something. Back to you, man. Be sure to watch that video after this one. It's important to note that it wasn't Gall himself that coined the term phrenology. He referred to his own work as cerebral physiology. But regardless, his ideas were so important to the field that he is often mistaken as the father of phrenology anyway. The person who actually named phrenology was Gall's student, Johann Spursheim. At first, the two worked together to do things like measure the heads of criminals and diagnose them with certain criminal dispositions. They would even try to guess what crime the prisoners had been locked up for simply by reading their skulls. Later on, Spursheim became Gall's competitor in brain localization theory. What Spursheim did was take Gall's central ideas and translate them into a popular movement. Spursheim worked with Gaul in France until 1813, when Spursheim moved to England to spread his own version of Gaul's ideas. Both Gaul and later Spursheim made lists of brain organs that they thought all people had. Spursheim took Gaul's list and changed the organization of the organs in the brain, adding some and moving or removing others. Specifically, Spursheim focused on optimistic ideas, such as teaching people how to change their brains for the better. He told people to use phrenology to identify their strengths and weaknesses, and then to modify their behaviors to be more virtuous. Gall was much more pessimistic, believing that humans contained a fundamental evil that could not be escaped from. One of Gall's regions that Spursheim later removed was the region for murder. At first, Spursheim's ideas were not taken seriously in England. But eventually, Spursheim spurred enough interest in the ideas of phrenology that the ideas began to spread. He did this not by showing the evidence for phrenology itself, but by being really excellent at dissecting brains. The spectators of his lectures and dissection demonstrations were so impressed with his anatomical knowledge and skill that over time his ideas seemed less ridiculous, because it looks like he knew what he was doing. And that's what convinced the next character in our story that phrenology was the way of the future. His name was George Combe, ironic because based on the portraits of him that I can find, he clearly never bothered to use one. He was a Scottish lawyer that was at first very skeptical of phrenology, but after seeing Spursheim's dissections, he eventually became one of the most vocal supporters of phrenology. He established the Edinburgh Phrenological Society in Scotland in the year 1920, and later found himself touring the world to spread phrenological ideas. Some of the ideas he spread were very progressive. Much like today's positive psychology movements and self-help books, he taught that people could improve their lives and become happier by acknowledging their own strengths and weaknesses. He also believed in humane treatment and attempted rehabilitation of prisoners, and opposed criminal justice systems that were heavy on punishment. 
In 1828, Combe published a best-selling book called The Constitution of Man, which was a philosophy book heavily influenced by phrenology, but was not really a phrenology book itself. This book, filled with Combe's optimistic ideas, pushed scientists towards the study of natural laws, and importantly, argued that people adapted to fit nature, and that nature was not created to fit people. But Combe had a darker side as well. He also taught that white people were superior to the other races because of their superior skull shapes. But Combe merely dabbled in the realms of racism compared to the next person to take up the reins of phrenology, an American physician named Samuel George Morton. Morton was writing a book about cranial measurements and was looking for someone to help him write a chapter about phrenology. Combe happened to be visiting America at that time and happily agreed to lend him a hand in writing about phrenology. While Morton did not embrace phrenology completely, he preferred his own methods of craniometry, he was influenced by phrenology. The result was a strange book discussing differences in skull shapes among races of people, justified using cranial measurements from an enormous collection of skulls. Morton made the claim that Caucasians had the best skulls, and therefore the highest intellectual endowments, followed by all of the other races in descending order. Morton is remembered today as an important player in the field of scientific racism. Speaking of scientific racism, absolutely watch the Step Back History video on this topic. Over time, more and more vocal critics of phrenology stood up and pointed to evidence that the so-called organs of the brain didn't actually line up with the scientific findings of the functions and structures of the brain. One particularly devastating rebuke given in 1937 in a published lecture by Dr. Thomas Sewall noted that after actually measuring skulls and brain volumes, the difference in their thickness furnished impressive evidence of the impossibility of ascertaining the volume of the brain by the rules of phrenology. Near the end of his rebuttal to phrenology, Dr. Sawall writes, Beware, gentlemen, of a science so delusive as that which pretends to detect and mark the countless varieties of human character and gauge and measure the capacities of the human soul by a graduated scale of brass. It was through rebukes by scientists such as this that eventually, phrenology lost all credibility as a science. But instead of disappearing entirely, phrenology took on a new role as a sort of party trick, similar to fortune-telling. What once started out as a science turned into people running their hands across the bumps of your skull in order to tell you what you wanted to hear about the kind of person that you were. That's where we got skull models like these with the name Fowler printed on them. Fowler phrenology was a truly pseudoscientific offshoot of the original phrenology. It was total crap. Some people referred to it as bumpology. And unfortunately, that's what phrenology is mostly remembered as today. So in the end, even though phrenology did lead down some pseudoscientific paths, it still deserves credit for changing the way we think about the physical brain today. Thanks for watching this episode of Art Explains. Be sure to check out the companion video by Step Back History and follow me on all of the social media accounts on the planet. <laughs> I'll see you next time.